I love this. This is really cool. I kind so of I stained it just to see how dark it would, and I'm sure if I put multiple coats it'll get darker. But I like the color a lot. What do you think? Yeah. It's not as gray as I thought it would be. I like it. I like the way it's got a little bit of gray in it. But I was hoping for something a little darker. Well, let's, we put a few but coats on it. Let's see what happens. Okay. You don't like the thickness of the top board? Um, I think maybe an inch. Thicker? Inch thicker, just because this, this... The height the, of the, the wall? is so tall. Go back, I think go that back. a bigger piece would make it look bigger. I can change that to a five inch piece really easily. Reed, what's wrong? <laughs> While it is in fact March of 2022, I'm narrating a video that I made in January of 2018 as I was first installing the Doug First Siding. This is a video out of the second year playlist. I never go back and watch those videos, but when I do take time to watch them, it really brings back a lot of fond memories. The cliche, enjoy the journey, comes to mind at the moment. But let me start from the very beginning and tell you about the siding. I bought a bunk of 1x12 dug fir siding from a somewhat local lumber yard, and this small little lumber yard buys the stuff that the big lumber yards don't want to mess with, and that would be this siding. It's probably grade 2 or grade 3 if I remember correctly. And I paid somewhere around $1,000 for enough siding to do the entire house. Because initially we didn't think the house would be any bigger than it is right here, my thought was that rather than doing board and batten siding from the first floor all the way up to the second story, my concern was that that would be too much. That it would make the house look too tall. Too many vertical lines on a tall, narrow house may not look right. So that was my thought. I would do the first story horizontal, the second story board and batten. At about this same time, I managed to buy a pallet of the Mesmer's stain that I would eventually use on all of the siding. And I got that pallet of stain at a discount because it had been sitting quite a while. And I don't know if that's why the stain did not go down evenly like I hoped it would, but regardless, where the house is now, the board and batten siding on the first floor, I believe will look better than the horizontal siding. The bottom line is sometimes you just don't know until you try. The whole thing was a giant experiment and not only was I learning a lot along the way, but I didn't have a whole lot to compare it to. So sometimes we just had to try stuff. And ultimately we're not afraid to go back and make some major changes to things that we're just simply not happy with. We have moved way too many times. We're not going to move again. So for this reason, I'm going to do what I have to do to be completely happy and satisfied with my house, regardless of how much effort that it takes. Ultimately, the quality of the siding is more than sufficient, and I love the Doug fir. It might be a little bit high maintenance, but I believe it's worth it.
As I watch this video, there's still part of me that's just a little bit shocked that I managed to even get this far. We really were not prepared to do this thing that we decided to jump into, and by we, I mean me. Cedar seemed to be along for the ride for a little while until she finally began to see the potential with the place. But this is a prime example of ignorance is bliss. I didn't realize how much work it was going to take to get water. I didn't realize how much work it was going to take to get the septic system in. I didn't realize that everything I did up here had a tendency to cost two to three times more than a conventional build because it's just a hard place to work. I was working so hard at this time to save every penny we could because I wasn't sure how much it was going to cost and I knew there were still major expenses associated with a road and a plow truck and a tractor and an excavator and all the other things that I would eventually need. But again, in this moment, ignorance could not be more bliss. But could you imagine if I'd simply given up? If I'd realized that at that time I didn't have the money to buy all of the things that I would eventually need? So I probably should have given up like the two previous people before us that purchased the same piece of land and in both cases they gave up on the land they didn't see the potential and it was simply too hard to work up here you might remember some of the early videos from that first and second year where I showed the cab over camper that was left behind They hauled that cab over camper in here and as the story goes they got stuck and stayed here for significantly longer than they wanted to before they would eventually walk out. That seems to be a common theme in those early days. A lot of people would get stuck up here because of how bad the road was back then and while the road has been improved it's still a challenge. This year, as a matter of fact, the road is worse than it's been in a long time. Did you do that, Reed? When I was running, I accidentally tripped it. And busted it? Reed, uh, do you want to help me fix it, son? Do you want to fix mom's snow, uh, whatever snow it's called? Snowflake. Let's Snowflake. fix it. You ready? Uh, is it quiet? Got your safety glasses okay. on? When I tell you to, pull the trigger. Pull it. Okay, let's do one more. Do it again. One time. You, you know how I feel about my holiday decor. 14 boxes. Oh, that's so cute. Thank you, honey. You're welcome.
As I remove every one of these 1x12s, I've decided to leave the nails in them and simply cut them off with my angle grinder. I have a concern that if I try and push every nail back out the way that it came in, that I may do more damage than good to the wood. Plus it looks a little bit better to me, so I'm going to leave the nails in there. But I do need to cut the backs off to make sure not only it's safe around here while I'm working, but in preparation for the 1x12s to be reinstalled. As I'm working on the siding, trying to get everything removed, Cedar and our second oldest daughter, Cheyenne, are planning her wedding that will happen in June. This is a natural motivation to get a lot of these little projects fixed around the house, because more than likely we will have friends and family around that we don't have around regularly. And I know this means a lot to Cedar, so I might as well do my part and see if we can't get the house the way that we actually want it to be once and for all. Once the siding is repaired, we will then start the process of figuring out the stain and how to stain all of the wood properly, hoping that it all turns out looking the same. Rather than rolling it on like I did last time, I think I'm gonna mask the windows and the doors off and spray the stain on instead. Some years back, there was a reality TV show that I would watch on the regular, and the show focused on a few different families up in Montana that were actively living the ranching lifestyle. Part of the reality TV show focused on a small family ranch where a father and son did their best to keep it going, where another part of the reality TV show focused on one of the largest ranches in Montana. That ranch owner had a helicopter that he would regularly use to move the cows around as he needed to on his very, very large ranch. I don't remember that rancher's name, but I remember one very particular situation where he had a few young high school boys working for him. They were actually living in the bunkhouse on the ranch, and one of their major responsibilities was watering the ranch owner's horses. These young boys, while enjoying the freedom of living on their own for the first time, forgot to take care of the rancher's horses. The horses went for nearly two days without any water. When the rancher found out that the horses had been neglected by these young boys, 
Naturally, the first thing he did was he watered the horses. He then went to have a heartfelt conversation with these young boys. He did his best to let these young boys know that what they did could not ever happen again. That those animals depended on them for their water. It seemed that these young boys felt quite stupid over what had happened. And after only a few days, they all quit their job and decided they wanted to go back to town. As the ranch owner listened to him, he had one piece of advice for them as they were driving away. He told them not to get comfortable with quitting. That if they were not careful, they would look back on their life and they would have become very good at quitting jobs. Naturally, he strongly recommended that they should stick it out, but they didn't want to, so they went back to town. I first saw that particular episode probably close to 10 years ago, it seems like. And I bet I think about that conversation that that rancher had with those young boys at least twice a week. I don't know why that struck a chord with me, but it did. That little scenario impacted me so much that I even shared it with my oldest son, Rhett, as he recently quit one job and went back to the sod farm where he worked last summer. Maybe that scenario impacted me so much because I simply needed to hear it myself. I don't know how many times I tried to talk myself into giving up on this thing that we were trying to do in those early days especially because it didn't seem realistic. And I knew even on the good days, it was going to be incredibly challenging. Obvious tools for the job, but these are the things that I made. Okay, piece of DOM tubing, some flat stock that has bent a little bit. That's the bottom leaf spring off of the old dually, the Dodge dually. This will not bend. Because I use ring shank nails, I start by using the smaller of the pry bars, get a little bit of a gap started. Once I can get these spoons behind the wood, it comes off surprisingly well. And I've been able to get a whole lot of the wood off without doing anywhere near as much damage as I thought, which is good. I'm gonna finish taking the back off, then I'm gonna take the front off, then I'm gonna go through everything and hand pick and figure out what I need. Then I'm gonna fix the front side of the house, opposite of this side first, and again, establish the look that we're trying to establish. Make sure that both Cedar and I are good with it. And then I'm going to finish the rest of the house in board and batten. This backside will be the place that I'm going to probably have to go over to that sawmill and do my best to make their wood look like it matches my wood.
Another crazy thing that seems to be happening right now is the box elder bugs didn't die from last year. They like to hide behind the wood and I'm gonna actually do my best to prevent places for them to hide. But as I pull these off, normally you would find dead box elder bugs and dead ladybugs. A majority of them are still alive. And that seems to correspond with our winters. Typically a cold winter takes care of the box elder bugs and we must not have had a long enough or a cold enough winter, I guess, to knock them down. But if this year they're anywhere near as bad as they were last year, we may have to intervene and do our best to get rid of them, but they can be very hard to get rid of. By the way, the back side of the house, I never put any stain on. So you can see what four years of exposure does to unstained wood. I may have to use a sander on this wood before I put the stain on it. And truthfully, I don't mind the natural look, but now we're in a bit of a situation because we've got that gray color on the front of the house. And I don't know that I want to sand the entire front of the house back down to bare wood. So we're going to have to do some talking and some figuring to see if we can't get the right color again for the last time. In my mind, as I was trying to figure my way through life, I always felt like every direction I was being pushed I was being pushed in that direction for someone else's benefit. For instance, the very first time Cedar and I bought a home. I was 22 years old. I was too young to buy a home. I had to borrow the money from my dad for the down payment. But we bought a home for around $80,000. As we were signing our life away, the loan officer was going over the numbers and she showed me how much I would pay for that home over a 30 year term, and just how much money we would spend on interest. That conversation with that loan officer, without a doubt, changed the direction of my life. As we left that office building, I told my wife, there is no way I will wait 30 years to pay off our home. Again, even taking out a loan seemed to be a construct that benefited somebody else other than me. In the early 1900s, before the Depression, there was less than 10% of the homes and the ranches and the farms in the country that had a mortgage on it. Most of those homes, those farms and ranches were paid for and most people were self-employed. Fast forward 100 years later, naturally, the statistic is completely opposite. Everybody has loans, everybody has mortgages, and the self-employment numbers year upon year continually go down as more and more people defer the risk and go to work for the big corporations. But in the last couple of years, likely because of all of the craziness in the world, many, many, many people are going back to the small business to try and have a little bit of control of their life. And I'm so proud of these people that have taken that risk. I am the descendant of a long line of people 
that fought and in some cases made the ultimate sacrifice for freedom. I've talked about the family tree a number of times, but it's important to me. The idea that somebody would walk away from what they knew, meaning their family and friends and the land they knew, for a chance at freedom, for a chance at owning land without debt. In my own life, it simply comes down to being told what to do, and I should thank my older siblings every time I reflect on this, but I have found in my life that I can't do the things that I truly desire to do when I'm forced to do the things that I have to do to survive, like pay the bills. For this reason, Cedar and I have worked so hard to keep the bills at a minimum. My great-great-grandparents on my dad's side left everything in England back in the 1850s. And again, I've talked about this a dozen times, but they spent months on a boat before landing in New York. And then they would spend the next 10 years finding their way to southeastern Idaho, where they would leave a legacy for at least one of their descendants to follow, meaning me. I wanted to have my version of their story. I'm grateful I didn't have to spend months on a boat, travel by train and by wagon to all of the places along the way that my great-great-grandparents would have to stay a little while. But I am so grateful that by their example, they showed me this could be done. But deep down, my great-great-grandparents have a storied legacy of freedom. And that is probably what I want for me and mine more than just about anything else. The freedom to do the things that we know to be good and true. The freedom to live where I want to live, how I want to live. The freedom to worship how I want to worship without persecution. And ultimately, the freedom to figure out just in fact what I'm capable of doing. It's not that complicated, but unfortunately we are watching the erosion of these freedoms happen at a very fast pace right now. Just a friendly reminder that we will see you in a few more days, hopefully with quite a bit more progress on the board and batten sighting. That's what it sounds like when a ring shank nail lets loose. It's a miracle I've gotten as much off as I have without tearing it apart, it really is.
Um, first part of next week, I will continue working on this and we may get enough installed that we can start playing around with the stains again because as of right now we want it quite a bit darker than what it is so the hydraulic cylinder for the excavator has been sitting a couple hours south in a big shipping warehouse where they're i guess waiting for enough uh freight before they haul it up here it was supposed to be delivered on the 23rd um, i'm probably going to have to take off and drive down there and pick it up myself on monday so I hope to get the excavator going next week. Uh, and for what it's worth, this snow is rapidly, rapidly going away. Um, it's 70 degrees today. It's almost too warm for my uh, favorite shirt. So it might be officially snap shirt season. So that's uh, always exciting. Anyway, I'm gonna keep grinding away on this and we'll see you guys in a few days.